Hello, I'm Cthulhu Plus, and today I'm going to be making a guide on top tips for EU4 from a beginner, myself, to other potential beginners out there. Um, in this video we're going to discuss what I think is the most important button in the game, alliances, monarch points and estates, wars, loans, mercenaries, and we're going to touch a little bit on the economy. Uh, the most important button in the game, I think, is this button up here in the top left, the little hammer and the sword. Uh, if you click on that, you have a whole bunch of tabs here that are all filled with really valuable things. From this interface you can build military units, ships, uh, you can core things, do religious missionaries, lower autonomy, which is very important, uh, culture convert, build buildings, do dev stuff. I don't know what this is. <laughs> uh, do diplo stuff. And more dev stuff. All right. Um, alliances. So at the beginning of, a, of your game, you should come over here, click the very important hammer and sword button, and go over to diplomacy. Uh, from here, you can click on alliance actions, and you can see who c will ally you right off the bat. Um, I'm the Brahmanis right now, so I'm kind of big, kind of powerful. I have a lot of people who are willing to ally me. Um, however, you know, you might not be in the same, same state, uh, but if you scroll down here, you can see how close people are to allying you. So you can make better decisions on, uh, who to ally. And speaking on who to ally... Uh, generally, when I'm trying to find an ally, I'm trying to find someone who's stronger than me uh, in the region that I'm in. Uh, I'm looking for someone stronger than me because it will help me expand. Um, so I'll get, an, I'll try and get an alliance with them, and I might have to improve relations first to get it. Uh, but the second part of that is currying favors. which can be done via, via influence action, yeah. Um, because it requires that you have 10 favors with your ally to be able to potentially call them into an offensive war. Um, so step one, find someone strong in your area uh, that you can ally or with a little bit of work ally. Uh, get the alliance, but even potentially before you get the alliance you can start currying favors with them um, so that you can use them in your wars. Uh, the second thing I want to mention about alliances is the alliances should be swapped out when they are no longer available to you. Um, let's say you start off here as the Bahama the Bahamanis and you ally Jampur. Uh, and you use Jampur to fight your southern neighbor here. Uh, once you take over this area, you're probably going to want to expand north. Uh, and so Jampur is no longer an ideal candidate. You can hold on to them maybe for a little bit longer as you conquer these, but eventually you're going to want their land. Uh, and so you'll, you're will you going to want to break that alliance eventually, and because you'll be more powerful, uh, you can look for other large nations, more powerful nations than were willing to ally you in the beginning. Um, and in this case, maybe maybe the Timurids would be someone we we would look into. Um, I don't play in this region too much, but uh, but you should switch out your alliances to best serve your expansion needs. Um, don't get bogged down with like 
keeping the same ally for historical purposes. Uh, the, sec the next thing I want to talk about is Monarch Points, um, which should be done, I think, after you do alliances. Um, oh, here we got complicated estates. Uh, generally, there's a couple estates you want to take each time. Um, the monthly administrative power plus one. The monthly military plus one. And the monthly diplomatic plus one. Um, monarch points up here are one of the most important things in the game. Uh, they're used for so many things. They're used for buying technology, buying ideas. Uh, they're used for bombarding forts, um, coring provinces, annexing vassals. Uh, they're used for so many things, and they're so important. So doing whatever you can to get more Monarch points is very important. Uh, and that includes taking a look at your rulers. These two are okay. Uh, and if they're garbage disinheriting um, or abdicating the throne... Uh, and Typically, I, I believe I've seen that you're aiming for about nine total monarch points or more. Um, nine is an okay ruler, and then the more you can get over that, the better. Uh, and if you're going to disinherit uh, or abdicate, uh, you want to do that before you finish your state privileges, uh, because you take a prestige hit, typically. Um... And you get more bang for your buck. Where is it? Uh, if you disinherit first before you take the patron of the arts um, estate, which I can't find right now. Uh, but before you, so do that disinheriting before you do the, you. Uh, take Patron of the Arts, because I think it's like a 15 before, and a, 20, a 25 after. Oh, it's here somewhere. I just can't find it. Um, other estates that are good to take is the, the lower cost. For advisors, wherever it is, there we go. Uh, and if you if you're having trouble finding um, allies, a, another good one that you can take is religious. Where is it? Uh, religious diplomats. I saw this. Yeah, here we go. Um, it gives you plus 25 with other nations of your religion. So that can help you uh, make alliances early early game. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is war. Um, wars are typically unavoidable, uh, and it's hands down the best way to expand. My, the rule of war that I try to follow is that I try not to, uh, get into a war that I, I'm not certain that I'll win, or that I'm uncertain. I try not to get into a war that I don't know that I will win. All, mm. Don't start a war that you're certain. Don't start. 
<laughs> Don't start a war that you're not certain you will win. Uh, and before you declare your war, you need to look at a few things. So, uh, click on the nation, go here, go to, to the declare war screen, and look at these numbers here. Uh, I have 17, my, me and my allies that will go to war have 17,000 troops, 5,000 cavalry, and 42,000 manpower limit. The people we will be attacking have 26,000, 8, and 66. So this would be a bad war to declare. We would lose, like, right away. Uh, and so you'll want to make your alliances and so that your numbers are bigger. You have more troops uh, in the field. You also want to check this number here. Uh the military tech level they have military tech 3 and we have military tech 3 uh, so that would be even if we had an advantage uh, having a higher mil tech can lead your troops to winning battles that they're outnumbered in uh, especially if you are battling in a fort or in a mountainous re you're defending in a mountainous region um, Miltech can definitely help sway battles in your favor. Uh, uh, and the last thing that you want to do before you declare a war uh, is make sure that your army maintenance is up. Uh, I think it's pretty common to lower your army maintenance in times of peace so that you make more money. Uh, but it takes, I think, four months uh, before your army is back at full morale after raising your army maintenance back up. Uh, and so you definitely want, before you go to, four months before you go to war, you want to raise your limit back up. Otherwise, your military will have low morale and they'll be more inclined to lose battles. Um, and you don't want that. Now, why do you want to declare war? There's lots of different reasons that you will want to declare war. Uh, there's war to capture land. Um, you can declare war uh, to humili humiliate your rival, uh, which is an Age of Discovery objective here. Uh, you can go to war against your rival and show strength, which will give you 100 of each mana point. Mana points, as I already said, are super important. One of the most important things in the game, if not the most important thing in the game. Uh, you can go to war to get money. Uh, some of the peace conditions, other than just lump sums of gold, are war reparations, trade power steering, um, all sorts of things. You can go to war to get vassals. Uh, there's lots of different reasons to go to war. Uh, lots of different peace condition options. Uh, you can pillage an enemy capital, which I think gives you one of each development dev in your capital. Um, all of these things are, are valid reasons to go to war in EU4. Um, and then, of course, taking land. Um, Which brings us to our next, our next topic, which is, uh, oh, no. Uh, when you're warring uh, for land, you need to be mindful of aggressive expansion. Uh, too much ag aggressive expansion can result in a coalition forming against you, uh, which means lots of countries will come after you and you will probably lose. Uh, and so when you are capturing land, there's ways to minimize uh, the amount of aggressive expansion that you take. One, if you're reclaiming a core of yours or your vassal that has a low aggressive expansion expansion cost, uh, followed by lands that you have claims on. Uh, 
followed by lands that belong to the nation that you declared war on. And if you have co-belligerated, which I will show you what that is. Um, if you've co-belligerated, click that little button there, um, a nation, it also has a low, lower cost to claim lands. Uh, if you don't co-belligerate, taking the, these lands from them will cost more aggressive expansion. Uh, you can still do it, but it will cost you, it will inflict more aggressive expansion on you. Um, another thing to be very aware of is your geographic region. Um, if you are playing in Europe, uh, there is a there's the Holy Roman Empire, which is a confederation of of countries. Um, and if you attack one, there's one, a strong chance that you'll have a lot of people coming after you, including Austria. Uh, but they also more or less act as one big conglomeration. And so if you, if you anger them, um, you will likely get a coalition of many members of the HRE uh, coming after you. Uh, they have also a special mechanic where um, if you take a free city from the HRE, uh, the emperor of the HRE will typically demand that land back, and if you refuse, uh, they may declare war on you. So the next thing we're going to talk about are loans. Uh, I was very scared of loans when I first started playing EU4, um, but you don't need to be afraid of them. Uh, you do want to try to choose to use them if you can, um, or at least uh, be willing to take them on. Uh, so typically, uh, there there's one type of loan that you actually kind of want to take uh, that is available through the burgers or the yeah this is probably it indebted to the Janes for uh, the Brahmanis um, indebted to the burgers indebted to the merchants guild you get five one percent interest loans um, it's a, it's practically free money, uh, and if you are, you should use these as a way to make more money. Uh, use these and build some buildings. Uh, use them and go to war and take land and demand money in a peace treaty and pay them off. Um, those are the the first loans that you want to go after. However, um, taking normal higher interest loans is also not necessarily bad. Again, as long as you are in control of them and you're doing something intentional with it. Which can include that you're in war and you have a negative balance and you're taking loans every couple of months to keep your war going. Um, at the end of that war, hopefully, uh, you will get monetary compensation from the nation that you're fighting um, and you can pay back some of if not all of those loans uh, and a trick I suppose uh, that you can use is if you pay back the indebted to the fill-in-the-blank loans uh, you can then immediately take them again uh, you will get a larger amount than the amount you paid off and you can use those lower interest loans to pay off the higher interest loans um, it works it's not a bad trick So that's going to bring us on over to Mercenaries. Uh, mercenaries was another thing that took me a long time to start actually using, uh, but are pretty cr pretty critical 
uh, to use in the beginning of the game for a lot of countries. Um, if you're playing in a region like Ireland or in Japan even, um, or, or any area where there are similar sized countries, hiring mercenaries, taking out your loans, hiring mercenaries, uh, and then going to war can help you expand really quickly in the, in the early game. Um, and I believe that mercenaries actually cost less to maintain before like military level six, military tech six, uh, than it does to, um, hire and maintain your own units, uh, Mercenaries also have their own manpower pool. So um, in the early game when you don't have a big manpower pool, going to war and having the the mercenaries uh, use their manpower pool saves your manpower pool, allows you to stretch out your war longer, maybe declare more wars over a shorter period of time to take land. Uh, it's very, very useful. Um... Alright, and so the the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, the economy. Now, I don't have a great handle on the economy, but there are some things that I have learned. Uh, first and foremost, I've learned that forts are expensive. Uh, you actually have a couple options in how you want to deal with that. Uh, one is you can sell them. Uh, that gets rid of that cost entirely. Uh, you can mothball them, uh, which saves you some money, but not as much as just getting rid of it. Um, but selling all your forts, it's what I typically do, but there is risk in it. Um, because capturing forts and having forts factors into your war score. If you sell all your forts and an enemy sieges down your capital, you're out of the war. They will have a 100% war score on you, I think, pretty sure. Um, and you're donezo. Uh, so, if you are worried about that, then maybe keep some forts around. But if you're not declaring any wars that you don't know you're gonna that you that you don't know you're gonna win, if you're only declaring wars that you know you're gonna win, ah, that's the best better way. Um, then it doesn't matter if you only have one fort. So. Deleting forts or mothballing forts uh, is a good peacetime way <coughs> to save some money. Uh, another thing that I've learned is that tax admin dev um, temples, they're not that great. The income from tax does not scale well in EU4. Um, there's not a lot of modifiers for it. However, um, dip, diplom diplom diplomacy development uh, does scale. Um, and that's because dev, dev impacts uh, trade, it impacts pr goods production, and goods production and trade uh, have synergy. Uh, so the more you dev provinces with high value trade goods and provinces with trade nodes uh, the better off your economy will be um, and again if you come into here you can look at the buildings oh. and here it sorts the buildings by the value you will get uh, if you build 
whatever it was I clicked, trade. Yep. Uh, by building a marketplace in these, you will get 7.3 ducats a month. 5.55 ducats a month. Uh, production. You'll get 83 ducats a month. Sorry, 0.83 ducats a month. Um, so those, those synergize. You also really want to build courthouses when they come online because they reduce the cost of maintaining uh, of state maintenance uh, and you can also go to war uh, to get money and keep your economy afloat um, war reparations uh, sees you get money from the enemy that you've defeated uh, over a period of time. Uh, if you're able to, in the peace treaty, get trade steering or trade power, again, you're going to be making more money from that. Uh, so war can also help keep your economy strong and going. Uh, the last thing I sort of want to go over is a, a bonus goody. Uh, and that is that there's a bunch of different ways to recruit an army. And you can do it here, recruit whatever, um, you can do it here, and say wherever you want to build it, which is easier if you want to spread the load off across multiple uh, provinces, but you can also do it from here. You want to add two infantry to this army, you click this twice. And the interesting about this one is that it automatically chooses provinces. And then once they're built, they go to the province that your army was in when you clicked this button. Uh, and then merge with the army there. Um, so that, I thought very, when I found that out, I thought that was very useful. Uh, again, uh, these are tips and tricks uh, that I, as a new player in EU4, found um, valuable. Uh, once I started using these regularly, I started having a much better time uh, surviving and getting stronger. Um, and so just to recap real quick, uh, start the game, make the best alliances you can make, use those alliances to get bigger and stronger, and then find better alliances. Um, and again, you use those alliances to get bigger and stronger, and then find better alliances if you can. And rinse and repeat. Um, your monarch points are crucial. Uh, you should probably declare war to show superiority on your rivals if you can. Uh, get those juicy 100 mana points. War is good for more than just taking land. Don't be afraid of loans. Mercenaries are your friends. And if you're trying to build your economy, focus on diplomats, uh, diplomatic development, trading, and production. Uh, if you have any additional tips, hints, or if I said something wrong, please let me know. Uh, as I as I have said, I'm a new player myself. Uh, thank you, and I hope this was helpful.